Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to our book launch today. Um, just bear with us a little bit at uh, the beginning of these Zoom sessions when we have everybody coming into the room at the same time. Good morning to everyone. Um, to get you excited and in the mood about talking about children and young people, uh, could you go into the chat bar and introduce yourself if you like, tell us where you're coming from and tell us either a television show, movie or book that really influenced you in your adolescence. If you could share that with us in the chat, if you want to, um, that would be a really cool way just to warm us up. Where are you coming in from? And what was a favorite influential book while we, while we fill the room with our people? And then once we get some of those in there, um, I'll introduce myself and I will introduce Rebecca. Have a look. So I am having a look at the chat too. Oh, we have people being shy in the chat. <laughs> You're very welcome to say hello. And we're asking people to share an influential book or movie or TV show that they watched when they were a child. So we're just gonna give it a couple more minutes for people to come in. Um, I'm gonna type my response. Wizard of Oz, really big for, for me when I was a kid, but also really big for me as an adult. Do you know that one, Aaron? Pardon me, you're stepping on my eyeball. I don't, but it's a great title. <laughs> I think it was by someone called Paul Zindel. I mean, it was early adolescence that I read it, but it had a huge impact on me, but I can't remember why. Maybe it was just the title. It's a really, it's a really good title. It's the idea that you could call a book something like that, I think in, you know, 1980 or whatever was. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some really good uh, young adult and adolescent fiction out there that came up in, in that time. Okay, still inviting a few more people into the room. People usually kind of filing into the room for usually the first five to seven minutes of these things. Noughts and crosses, amazing, yeah. yeah. We're going on a bear hunt. For those of you who are just joining us, I've just asked people to type an influential book, television show, or movie that was influential to them in their adolescence, since we are celebrating Rebecca's book on children and young people today. Oh, One flip of the cuckoo's over, nest. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Let's put in my very favorite. She oh. dates me pretty seriously, but uh, actually I didn't even watch that until I was a young adult, let alone an adolescent, but Buffy was really big for me too. Okay, well, look, I'm gonna keep an eye on the waiting room still, um, but we might as well go ahead with introductions. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Aaron Bailick. I'm a psychotherapist and I'm the director of Still Point who's holding this event tonight today, actually. Um, if you're not familiar with Still Point, we're an international organization and we have spaces in three European cities. And our aim is to explore the world of psychology and related disciplines like the arts, philosophy, and the humanities with clinicians and the psychologically curious. So we have a big program that's open to the public. So I think I just heard someone. Okay, if you mute your microphones, um, if you're not speaking, that'd be great, but we do wanna hear your voices a little bit later. Um, our membership is made up of psychological professionals and coaches, counselors, psychotherapists, as well as members of the public who are psychologically curious. Uh, we have an online community. We have a professional membership. We're going to be introducing an explorer membership, too, for people who are non-professionals but want to learn more about psychology and everyday life. And our vision, and we're deploying it today with Rebecca. Let me let somebody else in the room is to make access to high quality psychological thinking more accessible to everyone through education, events, and um, access to professional services too. So we have a directory where you can actually get good quality therapy in our rooms in London. Um, yes, so enough of the spiel about Still Point. Um, I'm really proud and happy to introduce Rebecca today. It, a book launch is a celebration and it's a bit early in the morning, but if it were later in the afternoon or in the evening, I think we'd have to have a 
bottle of a uh, bubbly something cider or champagne or something to celebrate Rebecca's book. Um, I've got it in my lap right here. Um, Rebecca is a highly experienced uh, counselor and supervisor and academic working at Roehampton. Um, I'm not going to read off her bio, but I'm going to introduce her. I've known Rebecca now for, I think, pushing a decade. Um, but it's also one of those strange relationships where I think we've only met each other maybe two or three times in actually face to face. Most of it's been been Zoom and that sort of thing. Um, but we're really happy to have her here today. And Rebecca, can I just invite you maybe to introduce yourself a little bit and then we'll go into the book? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much, Anne. Yes. Um, so I am a, a practitioner, first and foremost. Um, I trained uh, as a psychotherapeutic counsellor at Sussex University in 2000, um, completing that in 2002. And um, I sort of came out of an adult training, primarily adult training, but having done my um, one of my placements in a youth advice centre with young people. And I came out of my training at a time when there was a huge boom in work with particularly in schools counselling um, and and kind of didn't really ever think that I would work with children or young people, but just kind of fell into got just drawn into the world of working with adolescents and the world of, of working then with children and subsequently um, did more training and um, have been in practice for 20 years. Well, just, yes, yeah, sort of just over 20 years um, working with adults, working in schools with children and young people. Um, and yeah, and just kind of continuing to grow in practice, continuing to develop and about six or seven years ago, I thought I was going to train as a, as a psychoanalyst. That had always been my um, intention, really. But when I went into analysis, what, what actually happened was I started writing books <laughs> and found that there were lots of books that, that uh, wanted to come out of me. And, um, and so that's kind of where I've been for the last six or seven years is um, continuing to, to work in practice. Um, and then four years ago, uh, got, got the you know enormous privilege of, of um, the role of, of program convener on a brand new training for child and adolescent counselors and psychotherapists at Roehampton, and and that's now become you know a huge part of my practice alongside the writing books, the the training of of, of the next um, generation of practitioners to really go in and meet children, young people and families where they are right now, where they where they are today, um, both in their own lives, but also kind of culturally and sort of in the general where we are as a society. Um, it's interesting because when I first started at Roehampton, I was talking at open evenings about the need. This was back in 2018, talking about the need for an army of child and adolescent practitioners to kind of go out and 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 uh, meet the the needs, and of course now that need has just um, increased massively as well. And and yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing to be a trainer and to have seen the students on the program and other professionals in the field on placements, running placements, who've been meeting, uh, who've been kind of courageous in in remaining in in practice and and meeting the children and young people. Um, particularly over the last 18 months when, when that need for support and containment has never been greater really in that cohort. So yeah, that's, that's me, I think. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for setting up that, that context. And this is, I mean, it's a timely book given that's the case. I mean, we, we will be talking about it, but there's, it covers everything and it covers everything really concisely and briefly. So it's not just a really good book to to use for training, but it's a really great resource too. Um, just before we kick off on your presentation, Rebecca, I forgot the little bit of housekeeping was to let everybody know that we are recording this session um, and that we do share it with our community and we do share it on YouTube. Um, but I will be turning off the recording about 15 minutes before the end of the session. So people who would like to participate or ask questions, but don't wanna be involved in any kind of recording will have the opportunity to do so then. Um, and the way it's going to work is this. I'm going to hand over to Rebecca. She's going to do a really short presentation about the book so you can get a sense of its content. Then the two of us are going to have a conversation about that for a little while just to get you all warmed up. But the aim is to have the opportunity for all of you to ask questions and make comments. 
Um, and the way that works is you can raise your virtual hand or I will put it on gallery view so I can see if you raise your actual hand and start raising and uh, I will unmute you. Um, if you're shy and you don't wanna speak, you can also put your question in the chat and I will read that question out to Rebecca. And we really invite uh, a plurality of different ways of engaging with us. So do feel free to use the chat and we wanna hear your voice too, if, you, if you're happy for your voice to be heard. Yeah, and, and ask can... anything, ask about, you know, you can ask about the book, but also about writing books. I'm really, I'm, these are all things that I'm really happy to talk about and training and becoming a trainer so yeah just just whatever you kind of want to ask I'm I'm happy to well you know within reasonable limits within reason. <laughs> <laughs> you can always say no <laughs> okay uh Rebecca over to you um I know you've got a uh, powerpoint for us and then we'll have the conversation very after. short powerpoint in case there's any of my students who think oh god it's going to be another lengthy uh lecture but it's not <laughs> but it's so so exciting as, a, as an author um to be to be able to talk about your your book baby to to an interested audience is is just absolutely the most wonderful thing so hold on a sec i just need to move far okay so as i say it it's it's a huge pleasure to um to talk about this book um and, and every time I talk about it, I get to kind of reconnect with it and reconnect with the story of it. Um, and, and that I find really exciting because it reconnects me with, with the whole sort of point of this book. And um, so this is the third book in, in the area that I've, that I've written. I've, I wrote a book in 2015 about um, specifically looking at private practice with children and adolescents. And, and that was because I was, really trying to sort of develop my private practice outside of working in schools and encountering these these huge differences and recognizing that there wasn't really a book about that and so I wrote that book um, and then I wrote a book for BACP a practitioner manual which was very much about turning uh, the exciting BACP competence framework for therapeutic work with children and young people into a, a, a book that was kind of able to sort of support training so I'd done those two and then um, Susanna Trefgarn at SAGE was sort of talking to me quite a lot in 2019 about the possibility of a skills book. She felt that um, it would be really, uh, it would be a really useful thing to sort of bring a new skills book into, into, the, um, into publication. And I was deep into the process of, the, of, of running the training at Roehampton and, and I really wanted, I think because by this point, I, I was very much kind of my development was through book writing and I was developing and growing so much at Roehampton and still am. And so it seemed very natural that a book would kind of come out of those first few years of the course and that it would be a book for um, the trainees on the programme, for the qualified and for everybody working in the field, you know, that this would be a contribution you know that 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 we could kind of all make into really thinking about this integrated integrative approach to work with children and adolescents and I think what for me this book is has really allowed me to do is genuinely to explore the unique um, practice of of child and adolescent counseling and psychotherapy um, it really is so incredibly different from adult work um, and it really is a dynamic process and I think that was what I was really coming to terms with and I'm gonna I'll, I'll, I'll go into the slides now so that you get a sense of what I mean but just to say that the tree image on the front is very pertinent to this it's it's a very intentional image um, I'm not a very artistic person so normally when I do a book cover they say, what do you want? And I'm like, I don't know, you do it. I'm, I don't know, whatever you think. But this time I was very clear that, and in fact sent them ideas about the tree because the tree image is very central to, to the book really. So one of the big inspirations for me in writing this is, is um, an experience I had many years ago in a yoga class in Brighton, where the yoga teacher spoke about tree pose. As you can see in the picture, there's someone in a lovely Vruksasana. And, and the, what, what she told me, and I'd not really thought about it like this before, was that the pose, tree pose, isn't a static pose. You know, I was like, oh God, please let me balance on one leg and, and not fall over. 
But what she was teaching was that it's very, it's, it's in constant flow, reaching down through the floor into our roots and then extending up from that place into the branches and that that is in a continuous flow. And when I came to write this book, that image came into my mind very strongly because what I think I was getting at was that the practice of, of counseling or any sort of therapy with children and young people has to have a similar dynamic flow as we ground down into our developmental, theoretical and ethical understanding roots. And then we extend up through the core of the therapeutic relationship, which really is where we, we are, we bring ourself, but ourself grounded in those roots. And then we extend up into engagement with particular children or particular families um, and into the kind of the, the extension out into different interventions. Um, and then of course, contexts as well, as we'll see, the different contexts that work with children and adolescents takes place in. So the idea, the structure of this book, um, and, and if you've had a look at the book, you'll see, um, I mean, I don't know how well I can show you that it kind of refers you back and forward from different sections, just a, a, almost a sort of, well, not almost, but intentionally to represent this dynamic flow. So as you move into a later chapter, it will invite you at certain points to come back down into that developmental understanding. And so the idea is that this encourages an immersive experience, you know, again, rooted in my 80s childhood of choose your own adventure books, which I loved. I don't know if any of you remember them where, you know, you could choose which way you went. Um, and so there's this immersion, there's this potential for an immersive experience of flow as you move back and forth through the entries and sections, hopefully as you go, discovering ever new connections between core understandings and the process of effective therapeutic interventions. And of course, we know that every time we meet with a client and then we go back to reading or we go to supervision and go back to reading, we, we're reading it with new eyes anyway. And so it's, it's, it's a really big aim, I think, but my hope is that this book is, is alive. It's a living text that kind of you can connect with and really bring into your practice where you are and make use of. So I'm gonna kind of talk you through, the book is in four parts and there are no chapters. Each part has a, a set of entries. And the entries are um, of differing lengths, but they, they're kept very, very brief, really. Um, and the idea is that, that you are in this kind of, that they are interconnected and that you're able to kind of move between them and pick up extra elements of the topic from, from previous entries. But the first part, as I say, is kind of about the roots. It's about core knowledge. And, and as I say, I think, for children and young people practitioners, that developmental understanding, immersing ourselves really in human development is, is a really fundamental part of, of our practice. So, I think I've got a nice quote, yeah. So out of this integration of developmental understanding, theoretical approaches, research and clinical considerations emerge the skills and techniques that have been found to work most effectively in therapeutic work with children and adolescents. So there's the model of integration. We're integrating that developmental understanding, the theory, research, and what we have to deal with clinically as child and adolescent practitioners um, into a whole dynamic process. So why is this developmental understanding important? Well, we take a long time, don't we, as humans, to become fully mature. And that's kind of 25 years, which is a long time. And so there's lots of, as we know, these internal and external factors that influence each unique course of development. And of course, during the, that, that long developmental phase, there are all sorts of challenges and deficits which impact ongoing development and well-being. And often it's these, these kind of impediments to development um, or the implications of them that, that prompt a referral for counselling, whether that's from with a younger child from a parent or whether it's from an adolescent themselves or a teacher. And so as child and adolescent practitioners, 
we're working with clients who are themselves immersed in that process of development and maturation. They're going through it. Um, and often one of the real challenges and joys of work with this group is seeing those moves through developmental phases. You know, if you work over, even over the course of, you know, I don't know, 12 weeks with a child, if they're at a particular point, you know, you can see that that development shifting. And often when you're in the work, perhaps with an older adolescent who's been hugely anxious about, uh, you know, moving into the world, there's something about the therapeutic relationship that you, you've facilitated and you see them actually move forward and, and engage with, with their life in the world in a different way, in a more appropriate way, because somehow they found what they needed in the relationship developmentally to move them forward. And also the developmental understanding is really important when we're forming that relationship. So if you think about the tree, the core, as we'll find in a minute, is the therapeutic relationship. That in integrative practice, relational practice is seen as the, the agent of therapeutic change. But of course, we've got to find out where that client is developmentally in order to know how to kind of facilitate, how to build rapport and how to facilitate that therapeutic relationship. And it's really, it's really complex and nuanced. We have to understand that the early, early relational experiences that a child or young person has had will have a huge impact on how they're able to uh, respond to even the core conditions. You know, we might be offering an empathic understanding, um, but actually it may be very difficult for that child or young person to receive that because of experiences they've had. They may need to spend a long, long time developing trust before they're able to do that. And sometimes that is the work, just simply to have been a different kind of, of adult for that young person and, and, and enabled them to have an experience where perhaps they can build trust. But if we're not going in with a nuanced developmental understanding, we, we, it can be very easy to miss that and have an expectation that a 12 year old will be able to speak with you and, 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 and do something in a, in a particular way, in a normal way. So it's really important to recognize that, that that developmental understanding. Equally, it can work the other way, of course. So if you're trying to, if you haven't noticed that your client has actually shifted, you know, and you're perhaps trying to hold them back at an earlier developmental stage, you know, again, uh, and supervision can be really useful for that, really understanding how development is playing out in the therapeutic relationship. And of course, we know that the chronological age is not the same as developmental stage. Um, children, but but equally children of the so equally children of the same chronological age, um, but with different early relational experiences or environmental experiences, will respond very differently to challenging life events as well as to the attempt to support them via therapy. And then in part two of the book, we look at this core, the trunk, the therapeutic process. And one of the things that I say about this is that the counselor and co client co-create a relationship with the intention that the therapist uses their skills and understandings in the service of the client, in the service of the client's progress towards their own understanding of psychological health and well-being as it relates to them individually. So that's the whole thing. We're using that, that understanding, that developmental understanding and our skills in the service of that client. How do we find out how to position ourselves relationally in a way that can facilitate therapeutic growth for the client? So I wanted to just focus on one of the entries briefly, and I thought the therapeutic frame is quite an interesting one because of course, we might understand that if we have worked with adults in a particular way, but with a child or adolescent client, it needs to be discussed and set in a developmentally appropriate way using appropriately adapted language. And therefore the child or young person is empowered by, uh, by the knowledge of why they're coming to see you and who this time is for. And that can be a really important first step in work. I mean, it's, it's important in work with adults as well, but with children where particularly where the referral might have come from somebody else, and it might be about someone else's very well-meaning agenda, 
you know, they would like their child to um, be able to kind of have a sleepover or perhaps go to school or perhaps feel more comfortable in certain situations, you know, whatever is at the root of that referral. But with a younger child, it may that 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 desire for a, a therapeutic intervention may not be there, usually isn't until you get into well into adolescence. So using that kind of explication of the frame, explaining it in a developmentally appropriate way can be very, very supportive in terms of um, the young person facilitating that process because they know why they're there. And of course, we have to talk about confidentiality and consent, and those are very central to work with children and young people. And then set limits so that the child knows that there are limits to what's going to happen and what can happen in the room. Um, and that means that once that is set, then they feel, yes, I know what my therapy is. I know what I'm coming here for and what's going to happen. And then we are consistent and um, you know, we, we, we're able to kind of hold that frame and then let the live action, the live therapy occur safely within that relationship. And I also wanted to talk about building rapport briefly, because that's a really fundamental part of this, this part of the book. Um, you know, Anna Freud talked about it, you know, she originally talked about a preparatory period where you needed to kind of build trust with the child and, and, and get them kind of established in the relationship. And often, again, it's, there's a real difference between adult work where as an adult client, you may have thought for a long time about why you want to go to therapy or someone else may have been talking to you about why you need to go to therapy for a long time. So you've almost had that preparatory period. You may look through a directory of therapists and try and decide who you think might be right for you. Um, so it's, it, you, you've done quite a lot of that generally, that preparatory work, whereas children and young people haven't necessarily or won't have done that. And so that is part of the work. You know, and part of that is just being offering warmth and genuine interest and remembering that young people, adolescents particularly, often don't come across adults who are very interested in them as people. You know, they might come across adults who see them and project onto them particular ideas about youth and adolescence that we, we're all probably familiar with. So it can be enormously powerful without doing any fancy interventions to simply be interested and to be genuinely curious and non-judgmental about the child or young person, about what they like, about what they're into. Um, and it's really important to be aware, especially with adolescents, about your cultural positioning in relation to your client. You know, how are they going to perceive you um, and what impact might that have on building rapport? So be really interested in those things, be interested in their cultural background um, and how that might, that interest and, and knowledge and understanding might impact on, on how they relate to you and how you relate to them. And included in that really, because that cultural understanding and background is also, also about what it means to be a child or young person at this moment, you know? Um, and there are universalities. We know that anyone who reads Ericsson, Eric Erickson, um, understands that there is a universality of sort of, of adolescence in a way. But it is good to, to really think about what does it mean to grow up right now? You know, what is it like to, to, to be a young person in 2021? Um, it doesn't mean you have to kind of know everything about youth culture, but just to familiarize yourself with a language, just as you would before you go on holiday somewhere. You know, you want to know a few key words and phrases. You may not be able to become completely fluent before you enter that world. Um, but it's it's really useful to be able to, to be kind of uh, have have a bit of a language for uh, youth culture, I guess. And then in part three, there's a lot more to part two, um, but, but we'll move on to part three. You can read the book to find out the rest of that. And like I say, we're now extending into the branches of the tree, into the interventions, the techniques and strategies, but constantly rooting back down into developmental understanding, ethical understanding, safeguarding and theory. Um, but here we are now, we're going to do some interventions. So part three with its 
focus on specific interventions or clinical considerations has its roots firmly planted in the first two parts of the book. The understanding of developmental processes and environmental factors contained in part one, along with the exploration of the therapeutic relationship and process in part two, provide the foundation from which this develops. And I just give you an example of, of what's kind of in this bit. We've got a, an entry on symbol and metaphor, looking at kind of our understanding of metaphor, that it means to transfer, and that symbol is something that stands in for something else. And so by standing in metaphor and symbol, this places distance between the self and the event personal feeling represented. You know, and, and often we, we use um, play, don't we? We use objects or artwork in, in work with children and adolescents. Um, we're always curious about what their understanding of the meaning is, you know, and we may never move out of the metaphor with a child or, or an adolescent. We might stay in that metaphor as much as possible. And by doing that, we're allowing the projections to be projected and contained and worked through by the therapeutic process. We don't necessarily have to interpret or to say, I think what you're showing me is this. Sometimes it's cathartic enough, and Winnicott spoke about this, um, to simply allow that play uh, to, that projective play to just, just work itself through. But it, or equally, be mindful of those clients who are not able to make use of symbol and metaphor, those who've experienced trauma, some uh, neurodiversity presentations, uh, sometimes when children are, are very depressed, it's very difficult for them to use symbol and metaphor to play. And it's really important to be empathic about that, to understand it and to, to find a, a, a way of working with that, that, that also allows that child to move closer to, to their own meaning. And that moves nicely. I, I just wanted to sort of highlight this entry because it's one of my um, one of my favorite um, interventions to use, and that's therapeutic chat. And I was sort of trained in this to think of this as called wittering. And then I found that Peter Blake, who's a, a Kleinian child and adolescent uh, psychotherapist, had written about it in his book and called it therapeutic chat, um, which I think is great, a really lovely way of putting it. And it's a way of working in the metaphor without the play or creative materials. And we encourage the client to talk about whatever they're interested in. But, but while they're talking, um, we're hearing the metaphor, the metaphorical um, content of, of what they're saying. So they may be talking about Love Island. That's the one that I always, I think it's, it's, it's such a big one or was for a long time in my practice. Um, so I really encourage my clients, what are you watching on telly? I'm watching Love Island. Um, you know, you're immediately facilitating rapport and strengthening alliance, um, listening to manifest content, but also listening to those deeper meanings. So you're sort of hearing what they're saying about Megan or Jack or whoever, and connecting it in a way to, to what you know of that client or, or what you're feeling counter-transferentially. And it can really, without, you know, without kind of asking them questions about how do you feel about you know, this issue, it really takes you right into their world and deeply into their issues. Um, listen, we listen to it with, with evenly suspended attention while attending to the cues and unconscious material or meanings. Um, and but there are things in, I talk in the skills bit about what to watch out for and how to kind of do therapeutic chat effectively, but, but it's a really lovely way of working, I think, with, particularly with, with adolescents. And also in that, in that part, I look at other interventions, play-based therapy, working with the emotions, working with risk, um, trauma and abuse, identity, gender and sexual identity, um, neurodiversity. So lots and lots of, of, of different presentations that of course really sums up what we're working with as child and adolescent practitioners. And then part four, which is really where the tree is growing context and client groups. How does this dynamic tree grow in an educational or CAM setting? What are the considerations for the approach in work with looked after or refugee children? 
And how does the shape of the tree change when applied to working online with children and young people, which of course perhaps many of us have, have had more experience of recently. And then there's a little bit there about private practice and kind of just thinking about, you know, that's a specific context and what kind of thinking we need to do in that context. But I also look at CAMS, um, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, voluntary and community sector, online counselling, refugee communities, and looked after children as specific groups that you might find yourself in practice with. And that's it. I hope that was, uh, yeah. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, you can see there's definitely a lot in that book and we're gonna be um, inviting questions and comments from you very, very shortly. Um, just one thought that I loved your, um, statement about learning the language almost as if you're going on holiday and, and learning some pre, some key phrases and I'm yeah. thinking about like whenever anybody says to me like if you tell people that you're working with young people and they say you know oh are you down with the kids and I'm like mm. as soon as you use that expression you know that you really probably shouldn't be doing this work with young people yeah, yeah. <laughs> dead giveaway yeah. um so let me ask you what, I think I'm just going to ask one question to set a context and it might be a generational thing or not I don't know but I'm thinking about the field in general and how you were saying, you know, it's almost like armies of people are now moving into working with children and adolescents. And I think you and I were probably brought up in a similar generation where many of us were trained just really in adult psychotherapy and then often took our placements with young people because that's where they were available. It's exactly what happened with me. And then you kind of rock up in a school or further education college and realize that you've been completely mistrained yeah. for that job, yes. right? And then sadly, your first year on that job, you're you're failing all your clients because it takes you that long to realize that you can't be doing what you learned how to do. I mean, those skills are there, but you have yeah. to deploy them differently. So I just wonder if you could briefly say something about whether, whether that's changed, because I know now you work on explicitly training people for children and adolescent work, but do we still have that spillover of the the adult work and what, what's the field kind of look like at the moment and is that something we should be worried about or or not so much or what yes i mean i think it's it's such an interesting one and and um and it's it's kind of um it's something that i'm looking at a lot at the moment with i'm doing a phd at, uh, which is kind of all about the professional identity and and of, of practitioners working with children and adolescence, and it's looking at a paper that uh, Sue Kedjareis uh, wrote in 2006, where she specifically asked the question, child and adolescent counseling is a specialist training necessary and was kind of querying, you know, uh, what we're talking about now. And I think subsequently there has been a real shift in it, particularly from, for an, from an organization like um, BACP, where they have invested in uh, developing a competence framework to say actually before practicing with children and adolescents there is this this set of basic competences of knowledge and understanding um, skills psychotherapeutic skills kind of um, ethical understanding and meta skills that you need for this work um, and I think that has kind of sharpened everybody's minds now really into this idea that I think previously there was a there was an idea that you could have these child and child psychotherapists who'd done this kind of psychoanalytic doctoral training um, which is a wonderful training and they work you know with very kind of high level needs um, in in cam services in the NHS but then there was this whole swathe of children and young people who needed therapy and who they just, you like you say, we were kind of going in there and, and doing that work, but really without the, the breadth of skills and, and knowledge that we needed. And, and that's changing massively. And I am so, I mean, it's just an absolute huge privilege to be running a core training, a core three-year training in child and adolescent practice. And I think it's a, it's a game changer completely. Um, and yeah, so I think in 20 years, to, you know, another 20 years, another 10 years, even, it just won't even be a question. You know, there will be a very specific professional identity. And I think that will strengthen 
um, people's ability to stakeholders and fund, uh, you know, fund holders to say, we want a child and adolescent counsellor or psychotherapeutic counsellor or whatever in this role and know that they will have had that training. So, Great. Yeah. That's really good to know. And I think there are some people on this event today who are training specifically in that area. So um, I'd like to open up for questions from our audience today. Um, we'd love to hear your voice. If you'd like to share it with us, just um, turn on your camera and have a wave and we can unmute you. Uh, otherwise, you can pop your question into the chat. And as psychotherapists, I'm happy to hold a little bit of silence even when it's online. Oh, but we've got a hand up. Brana, um, I'm gonna ask to unmute you. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, seems to be a great book. Can't wait to read it. I am um, a psychologist. Uh, I work more as a social worker with um, a Roma minority in Berlin. That's sort of my, um, my narrow uh, field. And I started working as a therapist also. And um, it was interesting what you said um, about knowing, immersing somehow or, or finding touch with the culture these adolescents are in. So my question is, um, how do you, I mean, did you, do you have experience in uh, helping uh, children and adolescents in setting limits in their use of social media? Maybe that's very, very specific, mm -hmm. but it's, I think a topic that is very important. And I would like to know if you could give us a tip or two. So it sounds like something that you are, uh, that you I have a problem with that in my right. Yes, thank you. Okay. I, I mean, I guess what, where I would come from on that is, is again, to sort of, to hold that in mind is that something that that is is happening this idea that there's perhaps excessive use of of something and then just kind of think back down into the developmental roots and think okay where is this coming from this need so it might be um an external need or or a pressure um but equally I guess what I try to do is not get too fixated on the manifest thing. So not to get too caught up in an anxiety that this is social media or that this is that this is, but actually to kind of try and find out what that is doing for that child or young person. What are they getting from whatever it is that they're doing and how they're doing it? So to really, a bit like what I'm saying about therapeutic chat, I suppose. So where we're looking at a manifest something or other. So if I talk to three clients who are all watching Love Island, for example, and addicted to it, each one of them, when I listen to how they're talking about it, I hear something very different, that it's meeting a very different need in each of them and that they're relating to it in a very different way. And I would say exactly the same thing about social media and, and phones and things like that. I would be very wary of getting caught in a, in a cultural societal preoccupation. And I would pull it right back to that individual person and say, what developmental need is this meeting? And is there, if you've identified or they've identified that this activity is harmful, you know, how do we find a, a, a less either a way of processing whatever it is that's pushing them into that compulsive behavior, if you like. So understanding what's at the root of that or it's about helping them make a different kind of choice about how they might meet that relational need or whatever it is. Yeah, does that help? Is that <laughs> good? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a lovely question.